or someone's been crying out to the Lord he's heard your cries and he's given me a specific word for someone and this is a word in season for you heed it the last couple of Wednesdays I believe it is that God has given me words it's about dealing with appearance and how appearance can be deceiving and this is going to take it any even deeper but I got to thinking about if he's saying the same thing in three different messages obviously we're not getting it we get it but we don't get it so ask the Lord to help you get it you can get it in your head but not getting it in your heart where you get the understanding of it when you get it in your heart it will impact you in a way spiritually that will empower you to overcome. The message is entitled, Seeing Can Keep Us From Believing. In 2 Corinthians 4, let's pick it up in verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. In Galatians 5, Paul tells us by the Spirit, Do not grow weary in well-doing, in doing, for in due season you shall reap if you do not faint. And we're living in a time and people are really going through some hard situations and their heart is on the brink of fainting. But you have to keep persevering even when you don't have strength to do it. Because God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So he writes, Therefore do not lose heart, saints. That's what we don't need to do right now is lose heart. And here's why you will lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Things on the outward look bad. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The things that we cannot see with our eyes, that's being renewed every day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Sometimes, a lot of times, we will be required to fight for our faith. Sometimes we can just believe for something and it happens. Sometimes you've got to fight. You've got to contend for the faith. You've got to keep your own faith built up to keep believing that it's going to happen. What you've been believing is going to actually come to pass. So don't give up when it seems hopeless. Don't give up. Fight for your faith. Satan's after your faith. He uses circumstances to get to your faith. So you've got to guard your heart against losing your faith, against losing hope, or losing your, your strength to keep persevering. Keep persevering anyway. Having done all to stand, keep standing, right? In the context of chapter 4 that we have just read part of, it is about suffering as Christians. Go home and read it. You'll see it's all about that. Many times the Lord will allow us to be taken to the brink. He will. How many enjoys being taken to the brink of just like blowing it? Where you're ready to just give it up, throw in the towel, walk away. It's not fun, is it? But sometimes God will allow us to be taken to the brink. And there's a reason for that. It might seem like when God allows you to be taken that far out into the deep waters that God has forsaken you, but he will never leave us nor forsake us, his word says. He's right there with us. This is a message. This message is a word from the Lord to those who are beginning to believe that God has forgotten you in your time of trouble. 
It's like you cried out, you prayed, you fasted, and it's like nothing is happening. Am I talking to anybody yet? It's like, God, have you forgotten me? Do you not know my address anymore? It's not the case at all. Your faith is being tried. One of the hardest lessons to learn as people of faith is learning how to give control of our lives and the lives of our family, whom we love dearly, over to God to have His will and way in our lives. One of the hardest things to do for a Christian is to give up control to God. Amen or oh me? Boy, y'all are quiet. We don't realize just how much we don't trust God, and we don't realize just how much we try to control our situations, so the Lord will allow us to experience situations that are out of our control, and then He expects us to be still and wait on Him to deliver us. It's out of your control. Just wait. Do you know what it's like waiting on you, God, when everything's out of control? No, tell me all about it. This type of situations that I'm speaking about are, are those which stretch us to the very limits of our faith. If you're so far in over your head in a horrible situation that your faith doesn't seem to be enough, enough any longer to keep you in God's peace, then you will have to trust the Lord no matter what happens. Lord, I just don't have the faith. Then trust Him. Trust that He is good, that He only does good, and He'll work all things together for your good. So when your faith can't carry you any longer, just kick it into trust and trust Him. If you decide that the situation you're experiencing is so bad that even God isn't, going to turn it around for you, then you will open the door of your heart to the lies of the enemy and you will begin to drown. Jesus said in, Matthew, in John 6, my words, they are what? They are spirit and they are life. The words that I'm speaking tonight are not educational per se. They are spirit and they are life. If you hear this with ears of the Spirit, receive it with a heart of understanding through humility, then you will receive life into your circumstance that will give you hope, give you strength to overcome the lies that are coming against you, telling you God has forgotten you, God has forsaken you, God's not going to show up, God's not going to do this. Something's got to counteract that junk that's coming against your mind. So if you decide that the decision does that the situation that you're experiencing is so bad that God can't turn it around for you, and you start believing that it's becoming impossible, then it will overcharge your spiritual heart. It will overwhelm you. Then you will open the door of your heart to begin to listen to the lies of the enemy. And you'll begin to drown in thoughts and our feelings of fear, abandonment, confusion, despondency, hopelessness, and give place to depression or even worse. This is what happens when we allow doubt to take over our hearts. All these negative feelings and negative thoughts start flooding into our being. And we'll start thinking the worst case scenario about our situation. In fact, if you're currently in a very serious situation and you have no peace, but fear and every negative thought and feeling is taken over your every waking moment, this is an indication that your heart is fainting. And you're giving up on the Lord to come through for you. With all that Job experienced, which was beyond human comprehension because of the loss, the sorrow, the pain, and the anguish, and having to endure his good old friend's philosophy... He never lost faith in God. This tells us that Job loved God more than anyone or anything, including his own life. When we love God more than self, we won't struggle to trust God. When we love God more than self, we won't struggle to trust God or believe that he will never leave us nor forsake us, especially in times of trouble. He's right there with us. He's not a fair-weather friend. He only comes around when it's fun. 
However, in addition to loving God more than self, we must also relinquish control of everything that pertains to us to the Lord. That's hard to do because we like being in control as humans. However, if we don't, this can cause us to lose faith in the Lord's ability or His willingness to deliver us from hard or dangerous situations that threaten our faith and very existence. Consequently, we will begin to drown in doubt and fear, and this will open our hearts to the lies of the enemy to overwhelm us. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. I'll give you an example. Verse 26. The disciples are out on the sea, and a storm has come up against them, and Jesus comes walking to them on the fourth watch, and he gets down to verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Isn't that something, how God tells us to do something that is, seems counterintuitive to the situation we're in? But James says when you're covered about with all kinds of trials, count it all joy. Jesus said, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. He wants you to do the exact opposite of what your human nature wants you to do. Amen or oh me. And you almost feel like a hypocrite, don't you? When you start praising Jesus in this situation that you don't think Jesus is going to get you out of. That's the flesh trying to make you feel condemned. Because the enemy doesn't want you to praise God because that's the beginning of your victory. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on the water. Faith comes by and hearing by. So he heard what the Lord said and he jumped out of that boat. So Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, guess what he was doing? He was doing something no human should ever be able to do. He started walking on the water to Jesus. Wow, there's a song in that right there. Somebody needs to write it. He walked on the water to Jesus. But when? But. There's always got to be a but somewhere in there, don't they? But when he saw. Seeing can prevent us from believing. He was doing well until he saw something that, he, that overrode, overrode what he heard. We do well until we see something that overrides our ability to believe what we've heard. And when he saw the wind was boisterous, it was loud, it was, it was demonstrative, it was threatening, he became afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. He's a professional fisherman. I think he knows how to swim. But he let fear paralyze him. That's what happens when we let fear get in our heart. It paralyzes us to where we can't even do the simple things in life that otherwise we could do without even giving any thought to it. Amen or oh me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they had gotten into the boat, the wind ceased. Isn't that a fine how do you do? Self-preservation or doubt will cause us to take our eyes off of the Lord when storms get so close that they threaten our lives. Well, God, are you not going to come through for us? Is it not going to happen this time? Self-preservation's kicking in. Doubt, trying to find a way in. As long as Peter looked to the Lord, God gave him grace to defy gravity. Don't you think about that? He wasn't walking on water. He's walking on faith. Because when his faith stopped working, guess what happened? <laughs> the just shall live by faith. You might think if God gave Peter the ability to walk on water, that that would have caused him to trust the Lord, but it didn't. Think about that. If God gave you the power right now, the ability to walk on water, and you were able to walk across Blue Ridge Lake, you would think that would give you the ability to trust God for anything, wouldn't it? But it won't. You know why? 
There's a storm that's threatening you while you're walking on the water. It don't matter what level you go to. There's going to be a devil up there that's going to stir up a storm. You walk on that level you've never been able to walk at before, but now you're at a new level. You're fighting a new devil, and you've never seen this devil at this level before. Wow, I'm walking on water. What's that storm to me? But no, the storm intimidated Peter's faith. Hmm. You might think that humans who have been born again and saved from sin and, and hell and eternal damnation, you would think that we would always trust in the Lord, but that's not so. The only thing that can cause us to trust in the Lord is for us to always believe that God is with us and He is for us. Think about all the things that Moses did coming up from a background where he was a fugitive on the run for murder. And God calls him out of that place of hiding there in the desert, the wilderness of Midian, hiding out. And God says, I I'm bringing you out to send you into Egypt, the place you're running from, to deliver the children of Israel from the land of bondage. And think about all the times that he had to go before Pharaoh in his court on Pharaoh's turf and do the things that God told him to do. Don't you know that had to be intimidating for him to do those things as a fugitive? Of course it did. But he went in there and then he told Moses, he said, this is the sign that I'm going to give you that I sent you to deliver my people out of bondage. When you have taken them to the, to the mountain where they will worship the Lord. The only sign that really meant anything to Moses was not the ability to cause frogs to take over the land or turn water into blood or to see the firstborn of everything in Egypt smitten dead. The sign that God told Moses that was most significant is that I'm with you. And because I'm with you, you will overcome and you will do exactly as I tell you to do. That may look totally impossible in the natural. He's with us, y'all. And as long as we got we have our relationship right, our fellowship right with God, we don't have to worry about any other sign. He's with us and he's for us. That's all we need to know. It's not the water that we're walking on that could swallow us up. It's not the storm that is pushing us us to react or to respond that we need to concern ourselves with we need to guard our hearts from doubt so that doubt isn't allowed by us to cause us to give in to defeat and begin to drown in negative thoughts and negative feelings because whenever you're drowning in negative thoughts and feelings you ever seen somebody drowning they're, they're, they're flailing their arms aren't they they're trying to save themselves. They're out of control. And if somebody tries to go up there to save them, they can drown them too, right? Because they're what? They're panicking for their life. That's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants to get you to a place where you start panicking for your life. Then you get out of control. So we must guard our hearts against doubt so we don't get ourselves into that position of panicking. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. He'll find you this. Just hold on. God has told them to do what it is that, that was in their heart to go and spy out the land. So they go and spy it out for 40 days. They come back. The 12 spies, 10 are unbelieving. Two, Caleb and Joshua are the believing spies that believe the report of the Lord. The ten that were evil gave the report of the inhabitants of the land, and this struck fear into the hearts of the Jews. 
And it says in verse 26, Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey as the Lord has told us it would. And this is its fruit, just like the Lord said. Nevertheless, that's the Old Testament version of but. But the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Paris, Amorites, and the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people. Isn't it interesting that the unbelieving spies got the people worked up? That's what unbelievers do. It works up people of faith. Then Caleb had to quieten the people before Moses said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. We are well able to overcome it. you got to face it if you're going to overcome it, but if you face it in the power and strength of God's grace and power, he's going to give you the ability to overcome it. But the men who had but, there's that but, the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Is their focus on God being with them? Absolutely not. Their focus is on who? Themselves. It is us against them. Listen, it's, it's in America, it's the left against the right. It's the right against the left. No, it's, a, it's against God, y'all. This spiritual battle is against God. They're not against us. They're against the God that we serve. This battle don't belong to us. It belongs to God. Let's let God fight our battles, and let's not define ourselves against ourselves. Amen. We are not able, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad or an evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is the land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak. Wow, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. Read on. Verse 1. So all, say all. That means every last one of them. The whole congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. This is the response of what happens to people who, who are supposed to be following God, but they give themselves over to the lying spirits of unbelieving people, and it causes them to doubt God and to give up all hope, and they gave up all hope. They became despondent, they became hopeless, and they started weeping and crying all that night. And then all the children of Israel complained. See what happens when you have no hope? All you do is complain. What are Americans good at right now? Complaining and murmuring because they have no hope and they don't feel like anybody's in their corner to help them, but they are disregarding the very one who is able to deliver them and their souls from torment. And the, all the children of Israel murmured or complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us up to the, this land? To what? To fall? Are y'all staying with me? Don't check out. This is going to save you your life. It will save you hide. The, why has the Lord brought us up to the land? To fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims, would it not have been better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. In any crisis situation, as people of faith, you have to decide whose report are you going to believe and place your trust in. You've got to decide, and you've got to stick to your decision, just like getting married. You made the decision to get married. Now, when it gets rough and all hell comes against you, you stick to your decision. Divorce is not an option. Can I get a witness? You stick to it. 
because you made a commitment. We made a commitment to put faith in a visible God because we were promised salvation. The problem is we sometimes got to go hell to get go through hell to get to salvation. Stick to your your decision. Can I get a witness? How many is doing that now? Not many. Doubt caused the Jews, like it did Simon Peter, to begin sinking in and become overwhelmed by the negativity. Doubt caused the Jews to only hear the evil report of the unbelieving spies. Let me, let me say that again. Doubt will cause even Christians to only hear the evil report of unbelieving spies. So many Christians are living in fear today because they choose to only listen to reports of the news instead of getting into God's Word and standing on His promises to carry them victoriously through the trials that we're going through. All the news does is accentuate on the problems. And the reason being is they are for, uh, fear mongers. That's, that's why they're put on earth. Satan has them under the, his, his thumb to make sure that they only preach the propaganda of fear. Because he operates through fear. Are you hearing me? That will make you listen. Why in the world do Christians want to subject themselves to negativity and doubt and fear and unbelief unless they have doubt in their heart? Mercy. Get the doubt out. Now, the Jews were so stricken with fear about the report of the inhabitants of the promised land that they gave up hope. They gave up on the Lord. Then they opened their hearts to doubt and began to drown in that doubt and fear. And that's why they feared or they wept and cried all that night and began to murmur. Faith will guard our hearts from fear. Faith will guard our hearts from anxiety anxiousness worry and hopelessness but doubt will cause us to only experience negative thoughts and feelings of defeat that's what doubt does if we can keep doubt out of the church we will be so strong we would take the land literally but when we allow doubt to fill our hearts then the problems become bigger than our god that's what's going on right now. People are let, given in to doubt, and their problems are becoming bigger than their God to them. If you're experiencing what seems like an impossible situation, you're either walking in victory by faith, and, and you have uh, peace, or you are giving in to doubt, and you're drowning in negativity in your mind, in your emotions, and you will have no peace. Faith will help you overcome it, Fear will make you get up under it. You are only you are, uh, the only one who decides what enters into your heart in times of trouble. Now turn with me to Psalm 27. This will help you. Verse 1. David's writing this psalm and he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? When, when the Lord is your salvation, whom do you fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army, that's a lot of guys, isn't it? Though an army may encamp against me, against me, all of them against me, my heart shall not fear. Do you see that? My heart shall not fear, though war may rise against me. In this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to, to inquire in his te temple. For in the time of what? For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle. It didn't matter how many times the Jews or the religious leaders tried to destroy Jesus. He always passed right through them. And they were never able to touch him. Because he was hidden in the secret place of God's tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high on a rock. Do you see David's 
uh, perspective when all this stuff is coming against him. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Mm -hmm. God is the glory and the lifter of your head, and he will lift your head up above your enemies that are surrounding you. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Read on. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. Can you see what David is going through as he writes this song, psalm? He's got a lot of stuff against him, literally, as he is writing this. And he says, in, in all of this that's going on in my life, I would have. He didn't say, I did. He said, I would have lost hope or lost heart unless I believed. He let his faith override everything that the enemy tried to make him feel, think, or believe. He said, I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. God promised, I will work all things together for the good. Right now, it don't look good, but when God is done, it will be good. I would... I would, I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then he gives us this wisdom. Wait on the Lord, y'all. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And while you're waiting on him, be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Aha! Now we found the key. When you're waiting on the Lord and you're, you're doing everything within your power to be of good courage, meaning God's going to deliver us, then he shall come while you're believing and strengthen your heart. He will strengthen your heart. Somebody needs to find grace and mercy in that, that, that scripture. He will strengthen your heart. That's what we're needing right now. We need God to strengthen our hearts that we will not see the inhabitants of the land as great giants that devour the inhabitants of the land. We will see them as grasshoppers because we will see our God as the great God that he is and he will show us that we are, are, are more than conquerors through Christ. And then he concludes, says, Wait, I say, on the Lord. So I'm telling you in America, keep waiting on the Lord. Don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. Don't faint. God is going to come through. He is our salvation. He is our deliverance. He is our rear guard. He will surely come. He will come in an hour when you think not, and He will show up. And he will give a portion to those that were unbelieving and a portion to those that were believing. He will reward. Doubt, you might want to write this down. Doubt refuses to wait on the Lord. It's that simple. Faithful will make you want to wait. But doubt won't let you wait. Ask King Saul. Samuel said, At a certain time I will come and I will offer up to the Lord that, that offering that will be needed for you to go in and take the adversaries out that rise up against Israel. Wait on me. So he waited and Samuel didn't show up at the time that he thought he should have shown up. And so he says, you know what? The prophet isn't showing up, so I'm not going to wait on him any longer. Bring me the ephod. I'm a king. I shouldn't be wearing an ephod. The priest is supposed to do that, but I'm going to wear it. Bring me the ephod. Bring me the offering. I'm going to offer it up to God, and we're going to hope for the best. And the time he offers up the offering, guess who shows up? Samuel, because doubt won't wait on God. And that's where conviction kicks in. Well, now I understand I'm letting doubt make me be impatient, antsy. So if you're a Christian and you're allowing doubt to rule your heart, you won't have the strength or the patience needed to wait on the Lord until he can turn the troubling situ situation around for your good. Boy, some, there's some wisdom in that.
The context of this psalm is centered on David's life being threatened by his enemies all around him. He had to make a conscious decision like we have to do in times of trouble that he was going to wait on the salvation of the Lord and that he was not going to give up on the Lord and allow his heart to faint. So in other words, he wasn't going to stop believing in the goodness of God, in the faithfulness of God, and he decided to think that God was, uh, and would not think that God wasn't going to deliver him from his troubles. He had faith that God was going to deliver him, and God did deliver him. So we cannot place our trust in what we hear. We cannot place our trust in what we see in this world or focus on the way that situation seems to be currently. Faith works when we choose to believe the Lord's report no matter what is going on around us. Now, when it seems like your faith is on the ropes and time has run out for your situation to get better, that is the time to keep standing in faith. It's too late. No, it's not. It's not too late. I don't care how late it looks. How dead it looks, it's not too late because God had not shown up. Now, if God shows up and it don't change, then it's too late. (laughs) Now, remember, one of the hardest trials, uh, one of the hardest traits to die to as a human who is also a Christian is the willingness to give control of our lives and family to the Lord in faith. That's one of the hardest traits for us to give up is control. Nevertheless, the Lord will require that we trust him with our whole heart and that we do not lean on our own understanding to get us through trying times or troubling situations. Doubt is a very hard taskmaster. They put heavy weights on people and burden them down that's what the taskmasters did to the jews and if and if uh they weren't doing enough they pile more on top of them that's what doubt does it it puts more and more weight on us because it takes the responsibility off of god we will carry the weight of problems that we do not fully trust the Lord with. That right there is revelation. I said we will carry the weight of problems that we do not fully trust the Lord with. I said we will carry the weight of problems that we do not fully trust the Lord with. The things that you fully trust the Lord with, you don't give a rip about. Come hell or high water, you know God's got that. You don't even give it a second thought. But the things you don't trust God with, you'll carry the weight of those problems. You stay awake all night long worrying about that, trying to figure it out in your mind how you can devise a way to fix this problem. And everything you try to come up with falls short. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by the Spirit of God. We will carry the weight of our problems that we do not fully trust God with. What are you carrying in your heart that is troubling you? You have to make a conscious decision, just like David in the psalm, that you're going to wait on the Lord. Right? Y'all still love me? I have to live it too. Matter of fact, I already lived it. That's why I'm writing this stuff to you. Turn with me to John chapter 11. How many said, Lord, tell you in a dark place, it's going to be okay, you're going to come out of this, and even though God told you that, you still had fear eat you up because circumstance wasn't changing. Amen or oh me? It's, it's just human nature. Problem is, we're not supposed to be operating out of our human nature. We're to walk out of that, work out of that, or operate out of the redeemed or the new nature. Uh, John 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus, at, of Bethany, the town of Mary and 
her sister Martha. And it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, the one whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. That sounds like a dichotomy. He loved them so dearly, so much so, that he stayed where he was. Don't it sound like a contradiction? If you love some, somebody so dearly and you have the power to heal them, won't you just go on now? Right? See, that would be us. We go mess up God's plan. But Jesus loved them more than that. He said, I love them so much, I'm going to stay right here and let him die. That's how much I love him. I love y'all the same. Don't you find comfort in that? Yes, Jesus loves me. <laughs> now, Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And so, verse 7, after this, he said, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, there are there not twelve hours in the day. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about him taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Of all the times that the Lord has directed me to teach from this story of Lazarus' death, I have never seen what I'm about to share with you right now. That's a lot of times. The answer to the seemingly hopeless situation that had Mary and Martha stretched to the limit and stressed out to the max was there the whole time. Wow. The answer. It's been right in front of our eyes, and we missed it. I missed it. And it's been there the whole time. Where is it, preacher? I just read it. Read verse 3. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he who, who you love is sick. And Jesus, when he heard that, he said, Who did he say? Who did he talk to, y'all? The ones who Mary and Martha sent. What did he say to tell them? This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. They already got word in advance. This looks like it's over. Matter of fact, everybody going to tell you it's over. But I'm telling you before it even happens, before he even gets inside the grave, I'm telling you, this is not to death because you look at what you see, and I'm telling you to listen to what you hear. Mm. God, that, mm. boy, it lights my fire. They had the word of the Lord, and they ignored it. God has given us words of the Lord, but we're ignoring them. And when the enemy roars like a lion, we don't have any strength inside of us, so we believe the report of the enemy when God has already given us the report of the Lord. Whose report in America are we going to believe? He told them in advance. It's not unto death. You know what? What? You know, the messenger told us a couple of days ago, this wasn't unto death. 
He's in the grave. <laughs> I think Jesus is a little off his rocker. He missed this one. Because Lazarus is in the, dead, in the grave, dead. He's rotting him. So I think Jesus missed it. Wow. Mercy. Did Jesus miss it? No. It's that the people to whom the word was sent didn't listen to what he said. It's not unto death. It's for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified in it. They lost hope. And they allowed doubt to fill their hearts. And then this caused them to experience grief even deeper. Mm. Mm. See, when you believe in God for something, and it doesn't happen the way you thought it should, the, the, the offense, the spirit of offense can come on you and cause you to experience grief at a deep, deeper level than if you hadn't even believed at all for it. Because you had your hope up, and hope deferred makes the heart sick. Woo. So offense will make loss hurt far worse than if you were not offended. So I could imagine by the time Jesus got there, Mary and Martha were ready to wring his neck. Because they, he told them something that wouldn't happen, and it happened so they had the offense going on. By all appearances, it looked like Jesus was wrong about Lazarus' sickness not being to death because he's dead for four days. You know, that looks pretty dead to me. Someone that's dead four days. Does it not to you? Not to God. Jesus said it's not unto death. We have to earnestly. I said we have to earnestly. Seek the Lord. Even greater, when we're faced with situations that are contrary to God's will for our lives. It's not unto death. Well, this situation sure defies that one. Lazarus' death opposed the promise that Jesus sent to Mary and Martha about their brother, even though the situation seemed to defy or alter God's word concerning Lazarus, God's word prevailed. It's not over till God shows up. They thought it was over and God hadn't shown up yet. So don't give up on hope when, it, when he's three or four days late and, you're, and everything looks dead. Don't give up hope even then. Remember what he's told you. Do warfare with the prophecy spoken over you, Paul told Timothy. So even though it looked like the situation was defying and altering God's word and will for Lazarus' life, God's word did prevail over the situation, and Jesus was indeed glorified as he stated he would be. So we see from this story... Seeing can keep us from fully believing the Lord's report. But truth and, true faith in God's promises can transform even dead situations so that God is glorified and our faith is made even stronger. That may be the reason why God is letting it get so dead in America. So bad in America. People that have only eyes to see what's in the natural, ears to hear what are in the natural, but no faith to see beyond that. They'll find out where they stand. Well, if you'd been here four days ago, it'd been all right. So don't give up on God, y'all. Don't give up on his faithfulness. Don't give up on his promises if the trial that you're currently facing is even defying what God has spoken over your life. I don't know about you, but I needed this word. I don't know how he hid that from me. I'm going to have to talk to him about that. It's been in, right there in the Bible the whole time, y'all. He didn't have King James fly down here and put that in. This is what, 1611? 
It's been there a while, y'all. But it's not seen until it's time to be seen. And once it's been seen, you can't unsee it. <laughs> this sickness is not unto death. He told them that in advance. He ate the peanut and died anyhow. Well, God, I just don't know. Stand your feet. God, thank you.